because it's here it is. So, um, um, Professor Frank. <laughs> yeah, thank you, dear friends. I recognize some of you, uh, if not most of you. Jindrich um, told me that he's just doing, giving, uh, and working with you about existentialism, where Sartre is undoubtedly the main figure. And let me say, speak about Sartre on consciousness. Uh, Sartre has been revitalized through recent analytic philosophy. He recently appeared with Routledge, a volume, a Sammelband, with contribution to contributions to the Heidelberg School, in which and I are the main members of, <laughs> by the way, the only members, and so the main members. And uh, this has been friendly, if not enthusiastically, been uh, welcomed by the British or Anglo-Saxon speaking world interested in recent issues in the philosophy of mind. And uh, so let me give you a lecture on Sartre in the, philo in the uh, context of philosophy of mind, beginning with the localization of Sartre's of the kind of questions Sartre asks in a, so to speak, problematological context. What kind, how to locate the problem Sartre has with consciousness in philosophy. Uh, second, uh, let me show you how close he was to Fichte's, to what the Heidelberg School famously named Fichte's original insight. In Fichte, for Fichte, consciousness is full, a full stomach. For Sartre, it's entirely empty, and everything with regard of which I can say it is that or that or that is outside the emptiness of consciousness. This is why I speak of the transparency, which famously is one of the main theses of philosophy of mind. Tai, Bretsky, uh, Gilbert Hermann, but also of Sartre. Differently uh, from uh, Fichte, I expose in the Kantian Send, Erdere, uh, the Sartre thesis, and then compare the transparency thesis with uh, Thais, Tyler Burgess' attempts, in order to show that Sartre's position is superior to both of them, and that we should do it with Sartre, Sartre rather than with uh, Michael Tai and Tyler Birch. Okay. Uh, Gilbert Ryle, in 1949, in the famous book, The Concept of Mind, first and famously spoke of the elusiveness of uh, consciousness. The problem was well known to the idealistic uh, tradition. Let me just quote Schelling once in order to uh, take something from yesterday over into this uh, lecture. The subject in its pure subjectivity, you remember the A, a race to the potency of zero, das Ich in reiner Bloßheit. The subject in its poor subjectivity <clears throat> is only there insofar as I do not grasp or objectify it, and insofar as I grasp or objectify it, it is no more. Um, this is an indirect quotation taken from Kant's parallelism. You can resume the central argument of the parallelisms of pure reason in this uh, quotation. Now, it is indeed very evident that what I must pre presuppose in order to recognize an object at all, erkennen, ein Gegenstand überhaupt zu erkennen, cannot itself be 
recognized as an object. I give further quotations from NATO and from Russell, which all show into the same direction, which confirm and reconfirm what I said so far. So, uh, what does the thesis mean in short? Resumed briefly, that we will become aware of the subject, in its pure subjectivity, of our consciousness through an objectifying, turning back upon our representation, what tradition calls reflection. Reflection, the turning back, you have a representation. You do not know that you have a representation. You turn back reflectively upon the representation. Now you see a representation through objectification. The theory is short, it was short, trash. It's intenable, but this is the way the tradition nearly unanimously uh, mm, dealt with the problem, and Fichte was the first to show that this was wrong. Any attempt at grasping the phenomenon this way leads into circles and regresses, and this is uh, my contribution to the problematology of the problem. How could we even imagine the solution to this highly complex problem? We have self-consciousness, or some say they have, by the way, uh, Ned Block, who was tired and bored and uh, disgusted by uh, public, always saying, we have no self-consciousness, Mr. Block. He said, I have, some say they haven't, I have, may I continue? <laughs> I like this, uh, this way of answering. I think I have, I uh, suppose some of you have too, and if the phenomenon exists, what can be wrong? must be the theory about self-consciousness. If something exists, uh, there can be no wrongness or rightness. The theory must be right or wrong. Okay, we could say with Ken Williford, one of the main representatives of the so-called self-representationalism, this is the name they gave themselves, meaning that the <coughs> core necessary condition of consciousness is representation, like it's in representation. Here's a subject representing some aspect of the outer world. And uh, representation being the uh, central concept, and given that reflection on representation, as I'm about to show you just now, leads into circles and infinite regresses, we must not think that a higher degree representation represents an inferior degree, a first level degree of representation, but that representation immediately represents itself. They are in a way on the, on the right route, on, on the right way, but nevertheless commit a circle. Uh, this is what Willy Ford uh, has to say there about. It says self-consciousness just happens to be an objectively, uh, of an objectively circular constitution. And when asked how could a phenomenon exist which is circular, which presupposes the result, he answers there is no problem from an ontological point of view look at uh, non-well-defined sets which form the part of the antinomies uh, handled with, dealt with by Russell and Whitehead and uh, Principia and Mathematica. The phenomenon uh, sets containing themselves or sets, the, the, the set of all sets not containing themselves, for example, is no problem ontologically, he says. Uh, there is no circle in theory when I just say self-consciousness is circular, guys. That's what it is. I'm not circular, but phenomenon is circular. So what about circularity of phenomena? This is really false. 
the short version of Wefort's uh, uh, research. You will know him in Tübingen next. And he's a very sympathetic uh, guy. You will like him. Second, second way of coping with the problem, we could say that the primary content of self-consciousness is not the complete phenomenon, this ganze phenomenon, Brentano, think of Brentano, namely in thinking that self-consciousness is awareness of the whole phenomenon, is self, its self-representation inclu included, we would get entangled in intensive regressives. It's the Conrad Hammer who baptized these kind of regressives, intensive regressives, because they behave like a babushka. Uh, the, the puppet contains a smaller puppet containing a still smaller puppet, and the self-consciousness presuppose becomes slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and nearly invisible, but always already included. This uh, comes up when you choose a Fichten formula. The ego not only posits itself, but posits itself as positing itself. It posits the awareness of its positing. Now, if the self is that which posits itself, what is, it? what is this self which is positive? It is that which posits itself. That's positing itself, what is the self? And you see that the Babushka regress um, is covered first by another intelligent student of Fichtes, Herbart, uh, comes about. Therefore, the regress is partly called the karma regress, or the Herbart regress, or the Brentano regress, because it was Konrad Kramer who first uh, put the finger on a weakness in Brentano's ingenious theory of self-consciousness. Therefore, because this is due to the fact that we want to uh, represent a complete phenomenon, what about not, not going to represent the whole phenomenon, but only a part of the phenomenon? But then there would be no adequate consciousness, adequate being defined as as, as much content as subjective representation of the con content. Nothing is, remains hidden in the content to consciousness, and this is what Husserl calls adequate representation. We would not have adequate representation of consciousness if we decided uh, that self-consciousness represents only part of the phenomenon. Of course, all these uh, stratagems in order to avoid circularity and regressiveness. But then there would be no adequate consciousness, which should be entirely transparent for itself. But like objectual consciousness, this is Husserl's term, vergegenständliches Bewusstsein. You cannot say that, but in German. But the American uh, ingenious that translate objectual, uh, not to confound with objective. Objectual is a way of regarding a phenomenon, phenomenon which through this regard transforms into an object. It is given like an object. And we started from the observation that subjectivity can't be objectified without going lost. Um, Kriegel is the, besides uh, Willy Ford, the main representative of self-representationalism, he has the following uh, ingenious but angry young man solution. He has to get a bit more mature in order to come back uh, on, on his own solution. Stefan Lang has uh, criticized him ingeniously and I uh, report part of his criticism. Kriegel's construct M asterisk, so to speak, the representing, represents a proper part, M rhombus, of itself. Where proper part in Brentano's 
Mariology is defined of a part which can't occur without there being the rest too. So if you represent a proper part, you can be sure you have the entire phenomenon, but what you repre represent is not the entire phenomenon, but only a part. Now, M asterisk, the M star, the Castaneda sign for the DZ constraint, forget that, uh, represents a different part, a part different from itself, which is not exactly what we mean by self-consciousness. We do not want to have a representation of something which differs from the representing. We want to represent the representing as such, and this is failed by Kriegel. Uh, I could lose uh, more words there about, but uh, I resist to the seduction. Uh, by the way, this would be would introduce inference uh, into self-consciousness and destroy its uh, presumed immediacy. If uh, self-consciousness is the result of conclusion that we think about, ah, oh, now I have self-consciousness. This doesn't seem, doesn't resemble to the way we are acquainted with ourselves. Here comes uh, this ingenious, original insight, quoting Henry's famous uh, offsets from uh, 1966 in the Kramer Festschrift, not Konrad Kramer, but his father's uh, Festschrift, Fichtes ursprüngliche Einsicht, which runs like that. Fichte makes the point self consciousness exists, phenomena cannot be wrong or right, they have simply to exist or not to exist. What can be right or wrong is the description theoretical description of the phenomenon, and this uh, lead, the theory leads inevitably into regresses. Fichte's argument against the reflection model, which henceforth is called the reflection model, in, according to Henrich's reconstruction of Fichte's problem, uh, what I wrote a very freely translated from Fichte is not what Fichte defends. This is the way Fichte uh, defeats his objectors who uh, hold to a reflection model. He shows what happens to the one who takes the position of a reflection model towards self consciousness. So it's a reductio ad absurdum. Consciousness, says Fichte, comes about when an unconscious mental event is objectified by a higher level, one or by itself at a higher level. The higher level mental event is itself first order, so unconscious, and becomes conscious through objectification by means of a still higher level mental event that is itself consciousness and so on and so forth. Und so magst du sehen, wie du zu einem Selbstbewusstsein kommst, says Fichte. <laughs> the reflection model fails, means we need another model, since consciousness exists. The alternative model must trap the following error namely making the familiarity of consciousness with itself depend on a binary relation between two distinguishable poles. It is simply and uniquely due to the fact that we split a singular phenomenon in a relation, in a binary, mathematically speaking, binaire relation, where there is one pole and another pole. There's one pole too much in the explanation to explain, explain the self-hood meant in self-consciousness. We do not mean that we are schizophrenic. We mean that we are just one. Schizophrenia is a, a mental impairment which may happen 
into a self, but if the, the self came into the world already split into two, the schizophrenia would not be a mental illness, but the normality, the, the most normal phenomenon. In order to demarcate itself as an impairment, it must be distinguishable from a description of our self into which no two terms enter, but just one. There's a problem for, for all the theory. Fichte says, there is a consciousness in which the subjective and the objective can't be separated at all, but are absolutely one and the same. Strict, seamless, fugenlose, seamless identity uh, in the strict sense of yesterday, not in the uh, loose sense, uh, nature is mind. This is exactly what uh, Sartre begins with in his famous lecture given before the French Philosophical Society in June 1947. Conscience de soi et connaissance de soi. Self-consciousness and self-knowledge. And uh, he joins without knowing Fichte at all. He never read a line of uh, Sartre, uh, of uh, Fichte. Um, I had him asked through um, one of my good friends, a translator, a re-translator of Sein und Zeit, uh, Sein und Nichts, and he uh, told me that he never read Fichte. He, he read some Kuno Fischer. Yesterday we spoke about Kuno Fischer. Uh, he read some Kuno Fischer about Fichte and found that freedom, concerning freedom, he was similar to himself, that he thought consciousness modifies the world. We do something when we think we have consciousness. But this was all he knew. He never read a line of the Wissenschaftslehrer, had no idea that self-consciousness played a central role for Sartre. Uh, less even he knew about the so-called Heilberg School and the so-called Dieter Henrich, even though Dieter Henrich, who spoke elegantly French, um, translated his own lecture immediately into French, La, la découverte de Fichte. He looked I was about to say, he aurait pu lire ce que Henrich a publié. He might have uh, read what Henrich published in uh, French, but he didn't. He retired from academic philosophy, and this is a, bit, it's a pity. It's a pity because I think he's one of the most acute minded phenomenologists of uh, France. This is what Sartre says, and remember what I just quoted. D'abord, nous constaterons qu'il n'y a pas de distinction de sujet-objet dans cette conscience. No need to translate because the translation would repeat the, the same words. There is no difference in consciousness, so no binary relation, if relation at all. This is the point where first transparency or diaphanousness, as uh, the, some actual, uh, some present day days uh, analytic philosophers of mine put it. Here comes here is where transparency comes into play. It is conductive to justifying Sartre's famous thesis, namely, consciousness, conscience, is total solo, so entirely, absolutely different from objectual knowledge, Gegenstände Erkenntnis, which he calls uh, connaissance. Uh, the English have no possibility to translate this. We have, we can say, Bewusstsein und Erkenntnis. Uh, in English, there's no difference between Kenntnis and Erkenntnis, even though Hegel makes a lot of fuss about this very worthy 
distinction German disposes of. Can this may be non-conceptual uh, and non-objectifying, but knowledge always, because for structural reasons necessarily analytically, implies objectification and conceptuality. It's intellectual, like in Kant, there are some representations which do not need thinking, uh, intuitions, sensations, on the one hand, and there are uh, representations which necessarily are, I thought, uh, a comp uh, need or being able to be accompanied by the thought I think. For example, usage of categories or reasoning. reasoning. This, uh, yeah, self-consciousness is not opposing itself to what it is awareness of. It is not confrontative. Sakrastan. I'm here and I confront myself against what I'm not. This is why Sartre brackets the de of in the composite expression conscience de soi. They cannot say self consciousness that bewusstsein. French has to say, the French have to say bewusstsein for dich. And because this de, according to Sartre, does not confrontatively uh, oppose the self from the consciousness taken uh, of the self, uh, he puts it in brackets, which is a, you might say this is, a tr this is just tricky, but th there is a meaning, it's me meaningful. The first time he follows uh, Husserl, physical and psychophysical objects, for example, all the objects dealt with by Freud's psychoanalysis are objects. Sartre, which is mean, he uh, is not a Freud as we know. Uh, Freud is an objectifier of our soul life, he says. The so-called I, or ego included, which is not a habitant of our consciousness, but an object of our thought, something artificial, artificially created. Uh, objects are opaque, Opaque being the opposite term of transparent. Undurchsichtig. They split into an inexhaustible number of facets or profiles, the famous Abschattungen, whereas consciousness does not. Consciousness does not split into facets and uh, Abschattungen. Uh, this is uh, the what Husserl teaches in the beginning of the fifth logical investigation, you remember. Inadequate consciousness is object, object consciousness. The object is inexhaustibly rich in properties. So is not self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is adequate because it is, he does not say that, but Sartre interprets Husserl as saying, this is why, it, uh, because it is transparent. What is transparent cannot split into action. So, uh, being transparent and splitting into abschattungen is the, uh, the point which allows to uh, distinguish consciousness from uh, consciousness, consciousness from object uh, consciousness. Celui qui dit objet dit probable, c'est ça. In a very succinct manner. Who says object says probable. Who says consciousness says certain. Cartesian, uh, certain in, in the Cartesian sense of uh, certitudo. Now there is adequate knowledge of consciousness. This is because uh, consciousness has no intrinsic properties. If you enter into your consciousness, you don't see anything. Uh, this is because uh, why he calls it transparent. It doesn't split into profiles, abschattungen. It is not multifaceted. Third, 
it is absolutely empty and insubstantial. Uh, Descartes' famous substantialistic fallacy consisted in interpreting consciousness as a thing, a thinking thing, a substance cogitante, a substance pensante, a uh, race cogitans, a thing. No, it's not a thing at all. Things are what consciousness is about for something. And consciousness is not what consciousness is about. It is empty means all substance is outside of it. En, en un sens, c'est un rien, puisque tous les objets sont hors de lui. In a sense, it is nothing because all objects are outside of it. Nothing meaning not being an object, not meaning not existing. It exists, but not in the Seinsweise, in the way of being objects are. If substance intruded into consciousness, this is a famous metaphor uh, in Sattler's first published uh, um, article on the transcendence, the outsidedness of the ego. If substance intruded into consciousness, its transparency would be troubled, getrubed, getrubed, troublé, like an opaque dagger entering and so severing it from itself. This is uh, Sattler's uh, way of, uh, of making things clear. Uh, I see, I see you, if I had some content inside my consciousness, this would be like that. My eyes would be blocked from seeing you. But as there is no dagger in, introduced into my uh, consciousness, severing it from itself, and so objectifying part of itself, I can see you. What did Sartre win through this, his transparency thesis? First, he's got rid of the complication with the with qualitative character of sensations. You know this uh, infinite discussion about qualia and the qualitative character of, it, of experiences, the what it is likeness, the uh, Meinungen zu Mute sein, wie ist eine Fledermaus zu Mute? What is it like to be a bat? All characters thought to be inside consciousness. The consciousness is, so to speak, uh, um, colored in a way, painted. Uh, there's a paint inside consciousness. It's ready, it's warmly, it feels lovely. It feels like being enough. No, says that all these properties are over there. And if you want to get sure if you are in love with a woman or a man, look her onto her face and not into your heart. Because the heart says nothing about your love, but you will immediately realize in, uh, in looking at the face of your beloved. There it is. The last and not inside. And uh, Sartre, uh, the, for Sartre, the, his phenomenal qualities, interestingly, isn't it, transmute into extra subjective surface properties of physical objects. Why do I feel this relatively warm? Because it is warm. Why do I think it is not really hard but not soft either? because it is neither soft nor hard, but medium, and so forth. So uh, instead of attributing these phenomenal qualities to the consciousness, Sartre attributes it to surface property of outside existing objects. There he, uh, there he is, separates himself uh, mostly from Fichte, of course. B, he has evaluated consciousness according to Twardowski's phenomenal axiom, published in 1894. You know, Twardowski, one of the 
Lesniewski, Lukasiewicz, Polish Mariologists, Mathematicians, published uh, a doctor's dissertation on the object of consciousness, meaning that consciousness itself has no object and is not presented to itself as an object, and there formulates first a so-called phenomenological device, which is expelling objects out of consciousness, of evacuating consciousness of all content and objects. Objects are over there, never inside consciousness. See, self-consciousness owes, owes its transparency precisely to its radical inobjectuality, ungegenständlichkeit, as Husserl puts it. Vis-à-vis -vis of the en soi, it is a neon data, a nothingness of a nothing of being. There's no being in it. Being is of what it is. <coughs> or what it is about. It deducts itself from the world of objects. Deducts uh, just to be translated into German. Es zieht sich von der Welt ab. Es bringt sich von der Welt der Gegenstände in Abzug. It doesn't belong to the world of objects. Consciousness is not part of this objectual world. The Sartre Mox idealism, he means the Berkeleyism, as as Perzipi, or Schopenhauer, you remember the first uh, sentence of uh, Schopenhauer's world as will and representation is the world is my representation. Schopenhauer means the world is inside my representation. There is no outer world. This is just exactly the contrary of what Twardowski recommended. Expel the object out of consciousness. Empty the representation. Sartre mocks thereabout in a famous uh, article only three pages long, I think, une idée fondamentale de Husserl, l'intentionnalité, where he interprets intentionality as evacuating the consciousness and throwing all things outside into the world. There is the misery you have to prevent. Go over to the street, over the street, and help this old lady who is unable to, uh, to carry her apples over the street. This is not inside my consciousness. Leave the room and act morally. This is what the, the Sartre uh, says. And uh, he mocks idealism as a digestive philosophy. It's dangerous for the world to be considered by an idealist because the world uh, ceases to be there and is reconstructed inside a gigantic uh, stomach. It's like the wolf who devours the seven goats in the Grimm's Märchen and doesn't feel well after that, as you will remember. Um, he mocks idealism in uh, quoting a French proverb, connaître c'est manger des yeux, uh, knowing is eating with the eyes. It's dangerous for your beloved to be uh, recognized in this way by you, she disappears and is devoured. Uh, Sartre says who is really in love will not be an idealist because he loves the outsidedness of his beloved. He has no appetite to devour. Uh, I find this uh, inspiring, uh, inspiring in, in a literal uh, way. Sartre can bring off a highly elegant coup, what he calls the ontological proof of consciousness. The lack of a proper or inner being makes consciousness depend on outer being, être en soi, and so grounds its intentionality. La conscience n'est portée sur un être qui n'est pas elle. The consciousness comes about directed upon a being which is not itself and gives the phrase, the famous uh, proposition of Descartes, a very original interpretation, cogito sum, 
the sentence is true. It is apolitically uh, certain, it's a subtle following the God, but the being I can find in pronouncing Kogitosum is not my own being, but the being of the world, which is a necessary condition for my intentionally being direct directed. Remove the objects, there will be no consciousness. But remove consciousness, so the objects will survive you. So such as a realist. The objective objects are constitutive for consciousness. Not is consciousness constitutive of the existence of objects. Seems clear, but in a in a highly uh, upload idealistic context, uh, pregnant of Brunswick, uh, for instance, uh, this was revolutionary. I come to G. The contents of emotions or wishes too transmute into egoless properties of objects existing in themselves. Existant en soi-même. Feelings are ecstatically exteriorized to the world. Uh, here's a fam famous quotation. Quand je cours après un tramway, quand je regarde le Quand je m'absorbe dans la contemplation de portraits, il n'y a pas de jeu. Il y a conscience du tramway devant être rejoint, etc. Et conscience non positionnelle de la conscience. Uh, when I run after a tramway, when I regard or observe uh, the time, um, when I'm absorbed in the contemplation of a portrait, there is no I, there's no ego. Where would it be? It's, it doesn't belong to the purely phenomenological description of what just now happens in your consciousness. There is consciousness of the tram having to be reached. I must run already starting. I must, this is what I see. The imperative, you must reach the tramway, is an objective property projected onto the tramway, not to be found by reflection of your inner uh, life. There is no I. There is consciousness of the tramway having to be reached and consciousness, non-positing consciousness of the consciousness. Non Objectual consciousness of the consciousness, so self consciousness. Now, what about subjectivity, the consciousness we have of our consciousness itself? This is Sartre's uh, definition of subjectivity. Subjectivity, the consciousness we have of our consciousness itself. Where does it remain? Because we have so ecstatically evacuated consciousness that the question now imperatively comes about but there is consciousness isn't it uh, it's not an object it's not 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 but what is it or are you going as far as to deny the existence of consciousness this is uh, what i'm dealing with from now on Sartre's first response is negative and so unsatisfying <coughs> Consciousness is not knowledge, not cognitive, savoir, connaissance, referring to an object or a state of affairs, Sachverhalt. It is not an inner looking at, this would be reflection. There is not, therefore it's not exposed to a true false alternative. What is certain does not, is not in the need of Wahrheit's difference that the neo Kantians put in. There's no difference between true or wrong, it's just presented with uh, obviousness. Yes. Knowledge draws a line of demarcation between itself and its intentional object, but not consciousness. Knowledge versus consciousness. The savoir, la connaissance, implique distinction de l'objet et du sujet. The other phrase corresponding phrase with this is not the case of consciousness, which does not draw a demarcation line.
between the represented and the represented, I began with this quotation. You remember, this is what he says about knowing, knowing makes this demarcation line. So self consciousness is not a sub kind of knowledge. References to objects and states of affairs, objectual self reference included, lack apodictic certainty. Because Sriki, the object, probable. Who says object, says probable. Who says self consciousness, says certain. Um, here is a so stunning um, resemblance between uh, nowadays uh, representationalists not to be confounded with self-representationalists that I must mention them and the way how Sartre is different because my point will be the following to give you a compass in, in your hands uh, the representationalists are so self-forgotten and so oblivious of the subject that there are just objects represented, but no vehicle of which does the representing. And this goes farther than uh, Sartre goes. And here you have the, the basic uh, position, which is astoundingly close to Sartre's. And Sartre would have sympathized with them, and Michael Tai uh, uh, invited Michael Tai for a week to Hubing, we spoke about that, and he said, I love Sartre. Uh, I don't really understand him. This is why I'm shy to quote him, but I'm sure we have the same way of, uh, of dealing with uh, phenomenological descriptions of, for example, emotional situations. This is their position. Inexperience, to be translated by Erlebnis, not Sinnliche uh, Erfahrung. Inexperience. We are only aware of properties of what is represented, not the vehicle of representation. This is just now my question. You have understood that. When we look at the red tomato, no matter how hard we try to intro introspect the aspect of the experience that represents redness, all we succeed in doing is focusing our attention on the redness of the tomato itself. So the das Bewusstsein fällt durch die Maschen. There is no consciousness, just a red tomato. Harman, whom I quoted, obviously draws on Moore's famous thesis that perceptions are transparent to the intentional objects. When people are asked what they know about their consciousness, they try to introspect, to reflect upon themselves, then repeat uh, traits of the outer object. I feel like red, I feel like hard, I feel like being in love, a feeling like desiring, or they say things which are properties of the desired and of uh, the scene. Let's first focus on Michael Tai, who defends the view that the only properties of import met by introspection are worldly properties. Uh, features of the object existing in itself independently of an observing or representing subject. So-called conscious experiences, Erlebnisse, according to him, are completely empty, which means have no content of their own. Another quotation, another quotation from Tai. The best hypothesis, I suggest, is that visual phenomenal character is representational content of a certain sort, content into which certain external qualities enter. Tradition has it that these qualities are qualities of the experiences. Tradition is wrong. There are no such qualities as experience, of experience. Sartre would not, he would say, ah, well said, my dear friend, this is my point. Now the question inevitably 
uh, arises, how does consciousness, the representation of a vehicle, enter into the scope of consciousness? In other words, how does self-consciousness come about, according to this theory? Of course, we can imagine a consciousness totally absorbed by its object instead of itself. My attention is absorbed, so is not my consciousness. If um, Brentano says, um, in order to be conscious of something, you have not to attend to it. Uh, yeah. Consciousness can come up in, an, in the absence of any attention. Inattentively, for example, this is by the way an example uh, Thai gives. I'm working at my computer and outside there is a jackhammer, a thrilling, a thrilling uh, what is it? Something would be you make it true into the uh, into the street. And you are attentive of the lecture you have to give to your students in an hour, so you ignore the noise. Then a neighbor enters and says, oh my God, what a thrilling noise has this got me all this time. Did you hear that? I immediately say yes, and you now I realize that I have headaches. Ah. So he was entirely absorbed to the lecture to write. If attention and consciousness were the same thing, you wouldn't have had any consciousness of the thrilling noise of the jackhammer. Uh, but he immediately remembers to have had consciousness of it without attending to that. This is a very good example. Sattva gives a lot of examples uh, that like. Or somebody says, uh, in the floor, there was a bank for the students to sit down in attention of the uh, professor, it's, uh, the officer just now. And uh, there was a bank. Yes, there was a bank. Was there a bank, or did you see the bank? Uh, the person asked that way, he would say, this is absent. How could I know that there was a bank without having seen it? And now Sattva would say, what about the seeing of the bank, which was not attentive, but which indicated the presence of a consciousness and not only of an object. Because everything uh, seems to uh, come to invite the conclusion that we are so oblivious of our consciousness that only object properties survive. This cannot be a uh, subtle position. Now, what is uh, Thai's position? Let me go a bit uh, quicker. His uh, attempt at an explanation is unpromising. It's inattractive. And if you have questions there, well, ask me after, but I, let me skip it in order to win some time. Um, Sartre's uh, answer to the question I asked Thai is a lot more promising and a lot more attractive. Um, Let's begin with the second alinea. Sartre would have raised four objections against Thais ad hoc explication, which I have skipped. First, self-consciousness is immediate, which means that it does not come about as a consequence of a valid conclusion, inferentially. The contention that we have here to do with a reliable mechanism, to uh, Thais uh, answer, just gives a name to the problem to resolve. Mechanisms, however well lubricated, never attain the precision of a valid conclusion. Second, consciousness is apodictically certain. 
calling to Husserl and to Sartre. In opposition to objectual knowledge, as is alone authorized by the representationalist time. Third, uh, I quote Sartre, la caractéristique d'une Erlebnis, he forgot the part of his uh, German, his mother tongue was German, because his mother was Alsatian. He all time spoke to the little boy Alsatian dialect and he forgot it. Uh, and forgot German and had in Berlin he had to relearn German in reading Husserl, not yet translated, and in the Stalag uh, captured by the Nazis, he had a priest who helped him uh, decipher Sein und Zeit to French. It was not yet translated. Uh, then, by the way, the chief of the Stalag proposed him, Sartre first asked him to give him to read Mein Kampf, but it was an intellectual person and he was so ashamed about the miserability of this book that he refused giving uh, Mein Kampf to Sartre. And then he found the Mythos des 20. Jahrhunderts from Rosenberg, which Sartre had bravely read and found neither scandalizing nor uh, alarming, but just trash. Trash, nothing. A uh, bad book, he found. <laughs> Not good, argumented. And finally, uh, the officer said, uh, Mr. Sartre, I have what you wanted. I give you Heidegger's uh, Sein und Zeit. And then he translated. But you know, his German is uncertain. La caractéristique d'une Erlebnis, c'est-à-dire ensemble d'une conscience vécue et réfléchie, c'est de se donner comme avant de, ayant déjà existé, comme étant déjà là. Uh, the characteristic of an experience, which means a lived and reflected uh, consciousness, is to present itself as having already existed before, as being already there, and to, to be discovered by reflection, but not invented by uh, reflection. Otherwise, there would be a brainwashing. Reflection would not see what there was, but would posit what there was not. I dwell at this point. Uh, this is, by the way, a quotation taken from Husserl's uh, Zeitbewusstsein. Uh, die Reflexion uh, findet, worauf sie reflektiert, als schon da gewesen sein. And uh, Sartre was one of the first readers of uh, Edith Stein's and Heidegger's edition of the Time Phenomenology uh, lectures. According to uh, Thai, phenomenal consciousness, and I, I know the point is, a uh, third, um, what reflection finds, that no lies in the Fichte studies, at the very beginning, seems to already have been there. He continues what I just uh, said, if reflection would invent consciousness, it would not have discovered consciousness, but posited, invented, brainwashingly uh, found what wasn't there. So it wasn't, wouldn't be a kind of knowledge, what it pretends to be. This, by the way, is already written in uh, 1795 and precedes Fichte's original insight by two entire years. It's unclear uh, how many intercourse uh, Fichte had with his admirer Novalis, the father of uh, Novalis, continued the stipend Miltitz, who had uh, died, had uh, awarded to Fichte. So the Novalis family, Hardenberg, was uh, intrinsically uh, bound up with the uh, Fichte family. He was thankful, more than thankful, to all these guys, Hardenberg and uh, Miltitz. According to Thai, phenomenal consciousness is poised for conceptualization. But what should conceptualization take up 
if the primary experience is a listen, would have been devoid of consciousness. Thai speaks of recognitional concepts. Now, recognizing implies having recognized in the first time. So, Thai's theory must be wrong. Another theory must be right. And another representative of externalism or representation is Tyler Birch. To be short, he first confesses, uh, concedes, admits that there is self consciousness which is authoritative, Sartre would say, apodictically given. The English won't speak like these old German nonsensical guys. It's authoritative, it sounds better than apodictically given. Self verifying, self providing, and not only empirical, interesting, perhaps transcendental. And second, um, the individuation of an object largely uh, depends on a cause of influence of the objects on our sensory system. So it's not the work of subjectivity, but the cause of effect the outer world has on subjectivity. Um, now, uh, Birch says, white content consciousness, white content is the content, can, content which is not at all influenced by subjectivity, just what influences our sensory system, is bound up with self-consciousness. I have consciousness of having consciousness an object. This is how he puts it. And this sounds good. But Uh, and he, he uh, makes a point which is of uh, validity for uh, our discussion. I'm approaching the end. Uh, um, consciousness is content preserving. We need, do not need to have two contents of consciousness as in Brentano. In Brentano we have a primary object, the cupboard outside there, and the consciousness, the secondary object. Uh, according to Birch, there's just one object, the wall, and the consciousness goes without saying. It's um, built into my sensation of the cupboard. Alas, he thinks that consciousness consists in a reflective judgment. I put it in red in order to make you see it, jump it into your eyes. And if it is, if it uh, um, resides on a reflective judgment, it is not what Fichte and Sartre tried to show. This cannot be the case. If self-consciousness is built into the consciousness of the outer object, and second, the outer object dicts the content to consciousness, uh, reflecting judgmentally about my having consciousness of the outer object would necessarily add a second object to it. Now, Birch is right to say that it's just one content, and the content is preserved but he is absolutely wrong in explaining how this uh, uh, weird thing is to, uh, to work. And here comes the, the, the big uh, hour of Sartre. How can consciousness get aware of itself without thereby falling prey to creating a new quasi content, a secondary Brentanian uh, object. This is Sartre's response. response. There is indeed a representative of the object inside of consciousness. So he revises partly thesis this consciousness is absolutely empty of, of, uh, of features. As a representative of the object, in seeing the wall, I have a 
I have a consciousness of my representing the object. And this he calls a reflex. A reflex which is reflected by consciousness. This is complicated. This is a theorem rather entirely overseen by uh, Sartre scholars, even though Sartre makes a lot of fuss about the reflet, reflétant in his lecture given to the French Society of Philosophy. What he thinks is, we have the object. According to Twardowski, the object cannot enter into the consciousness. That, that would be the digestive philosophy, I devour the object. But nevertheless, there is an information inside consciousness, that not only the, the wall, Fichte's famous wall, but my representation of the wall, which is a trait, so to speak, inside consciousness, but harmless because transparent, not offending or not defeating the transparency constraint because a reflex, like a reflex on the water, I can look through it. There is something like a mirroring, but it is transparent. It's like a paint, but a paint so transparent that I can look through. It's exactly the way the object is given, or a Frege sense. The way an object is given to consciousness is a Frege sense. And this uh, interiority of the object is harmless to the transparency thesis of consciousness. Thinks Sartre. He, alas, he did not publish anything there about. Uh, my friend Gerhard Seel, who wrote, I think, the best book uh, existing on Sartre, Sartre's dialectic, where the thesis is that there is a dialectic in Sartre. Um, he first uh, dealt with this jeu reflet, reflétant. Uh, I could say a lot about that. Let me say a few uh, things. Uh, there, there about. Why does Sartre think that the reflex is harmless uh, to uh, consciousness? Well, it's, it's just a represented and representant, not the object. The object does not enter consciousness. The expelling, expulsion of the object out of consciousness consciousness remains entirely respected, but there is kind of a reflex. Now, uh, the reflection model immediately comes into your uh, mind. Do you think, isn't this a uh, uh, fallback into the reflection model? No, says Sartre. Why not? As long as the mirror doesn't mirror but itself, and no object come, comes into the play of the mirror ring, mirror. Sich selbst spiegeln der Spiegel, says Fichte in Nova Methodo. Uh, this is harmless to self consciousness because the mirror, mirroring nothing, is divided from itself by nothing. Nothing divides the mirror from itself. So the original formula. In self-consciousness, there is no divide between subject and object is respected in the theory of reflecting, uh, reflect. Um, now comes a fly, something uh, buzzing uh, through the room, and I expel the fly out of my consciousness. It is what is mirrored by the representative, by the reflex. And the fly does not belong to my consciousness, but must be expelled. It is that what is mirrored, but the mirror itself is harmless. Things, uh, Sartre. Um, why? There's another reason for Sartre to introduce this reflet, reflet temps. He says, we have to work like Hegelians. The 
the first step is not already the last. We begin somewhere and then bestimmen wir die erste Bestimmung fort. Which means the first determination demands for further determination and further determination demands for ultimate determination, uh, exhausting all that is to be said about the phenomenon. Now my first word about consciousness, says Sartre, is there is no divide between subject and object inside consciousness, otherwise we would fall into infinite regresses in circles. But it is clear that there is self-deception. I'm often wrong about what uh, I mean to be or mean to think. I pretend uh, to uh, combat an indigestion. I, uh, I'm blushing and, and alternately, uh, in an alternating uh, way, uh, growing pale because I have fallen in love with a student girl being a father of seven uh, children and a famous professor, it would not be a good thing to confess that I just now have fallen in love with a student girl. So I repel the thought uh, that I'm in love and replace it uh, by the interpretation that I'm not well. I must have eaten uh, some uh, uh, and foul fish uh, yesterday, for example, <laughs> a bit ridiculous. But, but what Sartre wants to do is to create the possibility for self-consciousness to, to suffer from self-deception. This is the famous chapter on mauvaise foi. His example is Charming, uh, a French philosopher. A couple entirely in love, but unconscious of their being in love. Sieht den Himmel voller Geigen. They go into the Jardin de Luxembourg and speak about how beautiful the, the Mona Lisa in the Louvre is and how much uh, prettier Brahms sounds than Wagner. And this is what they talk about. And suddenly, a guy uh, seizes the hand of the girl. And the girl decides not to have any hand, uh, no hand anymore. Uh, this is not her hand. Why shouldn't he grasp it? Uh, she has no hands. So she refouls, to speak in a Freudian uh, terminology, her consciousness, her uh, apodictic consciousness of her hand being grasped. And this meaning, uh, übergriffig werden, we say in German, uh, beginning kind of sexual harassment. She doesn't know of that. This must be interpreted. And if the last word were said about self-consciousness, that inside self-consciousness there is no divide of subject and object, this would not interpret this situation. So we must have a certain divide inside consciousness, but it must be harmless. Uh, but when we go further and determine consciousness further, for example, as being time consciousness, I depart from my past and go toward my future. The past is what I'm no more, and the future is what I'm not yet. Uh, there are negations of, of objects, of objectual contents, and I negate my past and say, this I did five minutes before, no more yet now. And uh, what I will doing when going home to the hotel is not what I'm just having in my consciousness now. So consciousness needs not only unity, but also separation. That brings about a Hegelian truth in Sartre, a kind of a dialectic. He is entirely aware, and he calls the harmless inner separation of consciousness, unity, uh, distinguishing unity from identity. He said, the table is the table. That's all there is to be said. But my being in love is not just my being in love. 
but I have to be my love. Das zu sein haben, eine das zu sein haben. I support it in a way. I make it be. It's a subjective initiative. It wouldn't exist uh, on its own behalf. And uh, this is what distinguishes the table which is a table from the consciousness which has to be its pleasure or its uh, sorrow. Um, so the indistinction of subject and object must be interpreted differently from the absence of any articulation inside consciousness. You have simply to take care of the divide not becoming harmful to the first thesis. And uh, therewith I brutally and unromantically and unsentimentally stop uh, asking a lot of questions to what I said myself so far. Uh, but I won't anticipate your uh, questions and uh, interpretation. Thank you.
born inside a representation. Now you ask, why is why for you? Why are you in love with this girl, and why do I prefer this uh, girl? Th these are content uh, characters. The content has to do with the way I interpret and I make sense with the world. But whenever I make sense with the world, a phenomenological description following Twardowski's device would to have to put would have to put it in terms of the lovability, the amiability of my girlfriend as being a trait of her kleines Grübchen here. This is his approach. Uh, you are not uh, satisfied, but uh, hardcore idealism may be characterized that way, and I think he is right. And if there is a fundamental discovery which distinguishes phenomenology from idealism, it is to give realism right in so far as consciousness does not swallow what it is consciousness of. Read uh, the logical investigation of Husserl. Then came his idealistic turn, and Sartre lost any interest in Husserl. He no more quoted him. Uh, Heidegger was an idealist uh, in a way too. Welt is just what the subject makes the world appear. Uh, no more interest in, in these uh, guys. A long story. But your question is good. Thank you for a very fascinating talk. One question I would like uh, uh, to raise with our master Victor Henry uh, in the background maybe. Um, this consciousness of, uh, of uh, Sartre must be at the same time self-awareness. It must be self-awareness. It must be knowing itself already okay. in a way which is, which is uh, prior to any reflection. Yeah. But still I, uh, I didn't see actually the point where this self-awareness comes about uh, in, in Sartre. Whereas uh, Ethan Henrik speaks about it a little bit. Uh, one, that, uh, one doesn't have to think of uh, consciousness uh, in terms of uh, kind of energy or something like this. But uh, the example with the electricity might be elucidated. So realize the very self-positing self-consciousness mm, according to Fichte, how Fichte saw uh, prior to any reflection, of course. Yeah. So it's something like electricity and the magnetic field at the same time, at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, relating to itself. Both from both sides. This shows something uh, Sartre would, at least uh, according to what you told about him, uh, deny. Because he thinks uh, this consciousness, this very core, must be something uh, which is simple, which doesn't contain any, any division. Well, there is no uh, division which can be expelled in terms of subject object there, but still there is one. And there is, it is exactly this division, mm -hmm. self relating, which makes consciousness to self consciousness. What do you think about this? Yeah. Yesterday we spoke there about, and uh, I told you that Henry, uh, since five years, is writing letters to me, wrestling about self-consciousness and what I think there about meanwhile, and how I reinterpret his attempts, which he abandoned as being failed. His loan in the 70s, he began in the 60s with Fichte's original inside. And in fact, we, we spoke there about, there are two models 
I did not present my theory of self-consciousness. I spoke about some empathetically, of course. Um, in an unpublished text, published, uh, written in 71, which Henry allowed me to read and even to quote when I wrote his uh, homage to his 60th anniversary birthday. Uh, was called Selbstsein und Bewusstsein. Uh, be is Selbstsein is being owned by an ego. The Kantian, I think, that follows the proposition. Um, und Bewusstsein. Bewusstsein being an entirely field like, anonymous, but transparent to itself, uh, relationless givenness. The givenness has the mysterious quality of being self-aware, familiar with itself, not with an ego. And this uh, article I find obscure, extremely obscure. I really worked and worked and worked and thought, am I so stupid that I don't understand it? Uh, there must be a point uh, in it. And I gave uh, the, the text this reading, which Henry accepted, curiously. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, I was wondering why, why, on what philological basis uh, was he, uh, did he agree with my interpretation? My interpretation? Well, the following. The field-like anonymous character has not to be confused with ego consciousness. The field-like uh, anonymous character of sensory uh, experience may be egoless. And Sartre is totally absorbed in dealing therewith. He is disinterested in cognitive phenomena. Truth, for example, doesn't play any role in his writing. And truth has to do with the authority of propositions which are thought. Only thinking can be right or wrong. Uh, being read and seeing read cannot be wrong. You make uh, baptize the color wrongly. You say green and mean red. But what you see is what it is. There's nothing uh, to be wrong about. Uh, thinking can be wrong and so can be true. And this is what is uh, the peculiarity of the other, not feel, the other usage of self-consciousness. And I tried to push it into the direction of Sartre. What you call a Bewusstsein is what Sartre calls conscience de soi. And what you call ego-consciousness is what Sartre calls connaissance de soi. And now comes the third point, uh, Henry's third point, according to me, he did not uh, contradict. Both are really irreducible to each other. There is no elementary self-consciousness from which the field consciousness and the ego, the cognitive consciousness, can be deduced as parts or instantiations. Except the fact that both are ubiquitous. Whenever you think, you know that you think. Whenever you have sensory experience, you know, you know in the German sense, ich kenne, uh, that you have this experience. And this he calls the Pussoir structure. Uh, not Sartre, but Heinrich. And uh, I wrote in Aspects of Subjectivity, he wrote an article, Varieties of Subjectivity, meaning subjectivity term subjectivity suggests the uniformness of the, the unity of a phenomenon which does not exist. In fact, subjectivity is realized in two varieties, field consciousness and anonymous, which Sartre is largely absorbed with, and in Kantian consciousness, which is intellectual uh, and which is kind of spontaneity, kind of do doing. You do something when you think, but something happens to you when you are disgusted, 
or uh, when you see red. You do not do your seeing red in the way you do thinking about uh, colors, for instance. And uh, Henrich wrote mm -hmm, to my uh, article, which is the only existent clear articulation of his website on purpose. <laughs> And I wrote him, if you don't agree with my having given an interpretation of you, please allow me to publish it under my own name. <laughs> yeah. Not to look too closely uh, on these uh, things. But clearly, and this would be questions I would have posited to my interpretation, uh, does Sartre cope with intellectual phenomena? He sometimes pretends to, for example, self-deception is an intellectual self-deception and not a sensory uh, phenomenon. And then he says, this is a famous uh, thing which recurs from time, time to time. Believing is believing full power, full fledged belief, Köhler Glaube, the, the, the Köhler Glaube ganz fest, according to a German proverb, which has been adopted by the French, le, la foi du charbonnier, Köhler Glaube. It's 100% belief, belief like the table is a table, identical to itself, and uh, this full fledged belief realizes that it is only belief. You believe that only, it's not true, my dear guy. You may believe as strongly as you want, you don't do but believe. You have no certitude. And this clearly is not a sensory phenomenon, but an intellectual self-deception. The, the nothingness says you are nothing but belief. And by this annihilation, anéantisation, says Sartre, the belief loses its identity and becomes conscious. But uh, being becoming conscious is paid by losing its fondness, its stability, its meta-like identity. And I find Sartre's analysis of the dialectic of belief is excellent. In second, it doesn't fit at all into what I said so far. So there must come the Henrichian, Henrichian review of Sartre. And by the way, I made my uh, doctoral exam, the oral part of it, on Sartre. Uh, now, uh, 22. 23 years old, and uh, <clears throat> I told Henry a lot of things, and uh, he wrote me two years ago, I recently dreamt of your exam about uh, Sartre, and that you said that difference must coexist with a kind of unity inside consciousness, and for the exam this wasn't okay, it was even interesting, but how is that possible? <laughs> With me. Okay, I see there are no other questions and and I you better work. thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I quite agree that uh, it's a good start um, to to begin with some kind of uh, pre-reflection, pre-reflective awareness uh, of oneself which is involved in every perception, even imagination and everything, mm -hmm. and agency. Uh, but first, my question is uh, that uh, is it possible into your account to incorporate also the embodied aspect of uh, this uh, pre-reflective consciousness? And the second, if, if we do such a thing, that uh, we might not uh, hold the claim about 
complete transparency of uh, self-consciousness. And uh, if we adopt Merleau-Pontian point of view, then of course uh, I have this uh, reflective awareness um, already in, because I'm bodily being. And I, as I'm moving, I'm aware that uh, uh, how do I feel, how do I cope with the world. And uh, but the, my proper body, the uh, height, uh, is uh, the part of obscurity of my self consciousness. I cannot, uh, there is a lot of affective, instinctive, uh, memorial aspects that I cannot grasp, that, that are just helping me to orient myself in the world. They are part of what it is it to be aware of my surroundings, but they are transparent to myself. He says it's the obscurity of the home necessary to the clarity of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I have one more question about your difference from Zahabi, uh, but because he also starts from this, but he doesn't need to uh, insist on a reflex, which I think is reintroducing some kind of representationalism. He just says that we have this elementary experiential self mood and uh, we can explain the self-deception that uh, we have usually this uh, uh, pre-reflective awareness, which is implicit, and only sometimes uh, we try to, object to achieve objectifying form of explicit self-awareness, and with this comes the possibility of self-knowledge, but also of self-deception. But he doesn't have this strange, to me it's a construct. It's like uh, something that it's not phenomenologically there. <laughs> Francis is a illusion or No, this one with the with the reflex as a proxy of reality. So there are many questions. It is an attempt. <laughs> uh, first, the body as a source of obscurity. Uh, Merleau-Ponty is much more adapted to Sartre than Sartre is to Merleau-Ponty. The entire theory of the body has take, been largely taken over by uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty without very clearly saying how much it is just another reading of what Sartre had already published. This is my malevolent uh, view on Merleau-Ponty. And second, you are absolutely right. Sartre was the first to say, not only have we uh, transparent self-consciousness, but we have a body which is a source of obscurity because largely belongs to the outside world. The uh, consciousness is a parasite, parasite, parasite uh, of the being elsewhere. And uh, what the being uh, en soi is closest to our consciousness in form of our own body. Uh, desires that there are rather is desires than not, and that we can be in love rather than not, is not our choice, nor is it transparent, nor the result of a decision or something like that. So it brings part of the world's inadequate, uh, the fact that the world is given inadequately uh, back to the consciousness. But already in uh, the transcendence of the ego, Sartre says, the entire realm of psychology is not denied by me, but put among the facts of the outer world, so are large parts of the body. And then Sahabi, uh, to be uh, malevolent and short, he took as much as he could need from the English school and uh, sold it under his own name. <laughs> and, uh, this is what he did. And he began by making things clear. This is what I owe to, to reading books from Henry Frank and Potters, and uh, not to forget. Uh, Conrad uh, Kramer, and then because the Americans were not interested at all in really uh, having information about the Heidelberg School, they asked, What do you mean? Oh, yes, I mean that what these guys 
published it in under your name and please do no more mention uh, the word Freiburg School. This it doesn't make you be uh, beloved among, in an Anglo-Saxon context. This is not, by the way, uh, he is a friend of mine and if here you would not be charmed about and amused about my characterizing him, but he would admit that this is largely true. In the birthday of the town, it's just imagine I'm a professor and give you uh, some, a task, something to work about. Sartre speaks of the birthday of the town. What does that mean, and what is the function of this obscure piece of theory? And you would then perhaps say things like the ones I said. Ist nicht so meine Überzeugung, aber ich, ich sehe darin einen Sinn.